Thank you very much. I'm delighted to be here. And congratulations for another very successful Concordia Summit. Uh, I, I'm honored and privileged to have just joined uh, the Leadership Council. Uh, as a consequence, I will be speaking for a shorter amount of time today, I promise. Um, you know, I'm a political scientist, and, and for political scientists, the UNGA is a little bit like Christmas. Or, or maybe it's a bit like Hanukkah in the sense that there's no way that you believe that traffic can go on for so many days, and yet it persists. Uh, but this has been a very interesting week, and it's, it's, as an American, it's been a, it's been a rather challenging week. Uh, there's no question that uh, concerns around the world from both America's allies and some of its antagonists about the future of American leadership, uh, America's values, its vision, uh, its, its mentorship, its accountability are, are front and center. Uh, I, I promised I'd talk a little bit about geopolitical risk, and this week I've seen two sort of significant changes in the, in the risk profile around the world that are, that are linked to questions of the United States. The first is everyone's been talking, of course, about President Rouhani from Iran. I think that the likelihood of an actual breakthrough deal on their nuclear program is significantly greater today than it was three months ago. It's greater because the Iranian government is showing some commitment, in part because of where their economy is. It's greater because the United States and the Europeans truly want to make something happen diplomatically. But let's also be clear, if it doesn't happen, there's also a greater chance than there was a few months ago of military strikes against Iran, probably not by the United States, but by the Israelis. Do I think either is about to happen? No. Do I think both are greater likelihood than they were a couple months ago as we look forward to the next year? Absolutely. Related point, very interesting. One of the biggest things we're seeing right now in the world is that six months after taking the presidency of the world's second largest economy, it is very clear that Xi Jinping is engaged in a real economic reform process. Not a political reform process, not human rights, but an economic reform process. We just saw this morning the plans for a new free trade zone in Shanghai that will allow for unfettered capital flows so great that the IMF is concerned about the speed. First time that's ever happened with a communist country. If you look at the trade frameworks that are being set up with the United States, it's clear that this is the beginning of something that might grow larger. And yet, if you talk to Japan, their view is that China has not changed this is smoke and mirrors, and they're enormously concerned about the Chinese military buildup and about the security threat to their sovereignty and the islands in the East China Sea. This is relevant because the United States, America's key ally in the Middle East is Israel. That is not going to change soon. America's key ally in Asia is Japan. It's not going to change soon. And yet America's interests and Israel's on Iran are clearly diverging. A little now, perhaps more over time. I think I'd make the argument starting now that America's interests on China and Japan's on China are starting to diverge. A little, maybe more over time. All of this has to do with an extraordinary amount of uncertainty and volatility in the United States, its leadership role in the world, and what the world order looks like. Most Americans love to focus on the U.S. as the reason for all of this. It's because of Obama. It's because of Congress. It's because of American popular sentiment. And it's certainly true that Obama's top priority is not foreign policy. 
and he has a different view of intervention than the Bush administration does. It's certainly true that Congress is, at times, a little dysfunctional. It's certainly true that the American public isn't real interested in engaging a lot internationally. But so much more of this issue is structural. It has to do with the fact that America's friends around the world are maximally distracted on their own domestic issues in Japan, in Europe. It has to do with the fact that Great Britain was seen as a leader in Europe 5, 10, 20, 30 years ago. Today, unquestionably, it's Germany. And yet Great Britain was always seen as having a very strong geopolitical role and interest. Germany has no such interest at all. It's a very different view of Europe and how it plays in the rest of the world. And then there are other countries, the emerging markets, like China and like India and like Brazil and Turkey and Indonesia, and they are much less capable of playing a global role. And they're also much less interested. And to the extent they are interested, their values, their political and economic systems, their preferences are different from those of the United States and the advanced industrial democracies. And that's not because they're bad. It's because they're at a different stage of development. The Chinese don't care as much about global warming as the Americans do. And the reason for that is because if you give cheap coal to 500 million Chinese living in the North and you take five years off their life expectancy, their response is not outrage and demonstration. Their response is, boy, we need that coal. When the United States had Americans at that level of development, they would have felt similarly about energy. Now we're wealthy enough, we can start addressing some of these issues in a different way. All of that means that structurally we are entering a period of unprecedented geopolitical uncertainty and volatility. U.S.-led global institutions like the World Bank and the IMF and the United Nations and the G20 and the WTO and the Bretton Woods Accord will increasingly be challenged by an absence of U.S. and global leadership. In some cases, they will be replaced. As, as, for example, on the military front, collective security in NATO, very important. U.S. unilateralism on NSA surveillance, very important. Very different in terms of how allies think about the United States. On trade, the U.S. is very multilateral. The Trans-Pacific Partnership, the TTIP with Europe. It's not global, it's not Doha. It's a smaller coalition of the willing. On climate, not much is happening because there's still global summits and nothing, nothing can move at that level. The whole concept of public and private partnerships, finding areas where government and non-government actors can work together on issues of key mutual interest where global won't work, is broken, has never been more important. And it's just starting. We'll see so much more of that going forward. We'll see so much more importance. It's the main reason I joined the Leadership Council of the Concordia Summit, from the fact that I love the guys that run it. Um, you know, the final point I want to raise, especially given the folks that are speaking right after me, is the one other thing we have to understand in this global environment is emerging markets don't get a free ride. They may not have the capacity to do a lot of global leadership, but we will be scrutinizing their policy capabilities even more. And we'll do that because they have middle classes that will make demands of their governments. And if they get it wrong, you'll have instability. It's not like what happens if you get it wrong for the middle class in the U.S. We watch Jon Stewart, we get upset, we then change the channel. You do that in Egypt, as they have, or Tunisia, as they have, or Indonesia, right, or Russia, and you get instability. And some of that instability can rock these countries, and it's going to get harder over the next year. Harder not only because there are unprecedented numbers of elections across the major emerging markets in countries like Brazil and Turkey and Indonesia, but also because interest rates are going up as the U.S. starts tapering and ends quantitative easing. And you think interest rates matter for your mortgages here in New York? Watch what it means for borrowing for key emerging markets and the challenges those countries will have. 
Final point. The right side of this curve is occupied right now by so many sub-Saharan African countries. There's so much opportunity there where the, where the globalization, the urbanization is just getting to a level where they can start improving governance in a real way. It's not just about commodities extraction anymore. It's about building infrastructure from the ground up. And it's about services and it's about consumerism. In this environment, there are certainly lots of problems in sub-Saharan Africa, but there are also extraordinary opportunities. And I know that your next two guests are going to talk a lot about that. My distinct pleasure being with you today. A happy lunch and a wonderful summit. Thank you.